do you still today with everything going on believe that trauma is one of the main contributing factors to addiction if i can just begin by talking about what addiction is and ask you a question about it then the answer to your inquiry will emerge okay so addiction is manifested in any behavior that a f- person finds temporary relief or pleasure in and therefore craves but then suffers negative consequences and is difficulty giving up despite the negative consequence so that's what an addiction is okay now so craving pleasure relief in the short term harm in the long term inability to give it up now notice that in my definition i said nothing about drugs i said any behavior so it could be drugs of course cocaine crystal meth opiates alcohol nicotine caffeine could also be sex gambling pornography shopping eating work internet gaming just about anything and the question i always ask people and i'm going to ask you this now so you've had your addictions i don't know your personal history but i don't need to know what it was what i'm going to ask you is this not what you're addicted to but what did it give you in the short term that you wanted what did you crave about it security numbing of pain escaping gave me peace of mind okay peace of mind security numbing of pain are those good things or bad things in themselves innately they're good right we need those things who doesn't want security who doesn't want peace of mind who doesn't want relief from pain in other words the addiction wasn't your primary problem it wasn't the disease the addiction was your attempt to solve the problem the problem of emotional pain the problem of lack of peace the lack of security then if we ask what is the source of the pain what is the lack of security all about why don't you have peace of mind we get to trauma so the fundamental cause of all addictions and i don't care what they are to is always trauma that results in us having emotional pain distress lack of peace so my mantra on addiction is not why the addiction but why the pain and to understand people's pain you have to look into their life histories not this idea of that you got this genetic disease which is complete nonsense it's scientific nonsense not this idea that you made some bad choices because i never met a single person in my medical career or since or before who ever chose to be an addict the question is why were you in pain what did you need to run away from and that answer is always is rooted in trauma yes <laughs> and i agree with you and i've often said to people that once you get into recovery like that's where a lot of the work starts cuz now you have to really look at like why you were using whatever substance or thing in the first place to cope or numb pain and begin to find healthier coping mechanisms to heal from that and then grow into a better version of yourself if you could explain i guess for maybe people listening to this that maybe they're not as familiar on the impact of trauma and what it does to our brains and the neuroscience of it if you could explain to the best of your ability like how does trauma change our brains sure so first of all what is trauma so the, the actual meaning of the word trauma is a wound that's the greek word for wound or wounding so trauma is a physical or a psychological wounding So what causes that wounding? What causes that wounding is either when bad things happen that shouldn't have happened, such as happened to a lot of people, says the sexual abuse in childhood, emotional abuse, physical abuse, neglect, an emotionally very unsafe family environment in the midst of a divorce or family conflict, violence in the family, a parent being addicted, a parent being jailed, a parent dying, neglect. These are very wounding experiences for young children. Very wounding. But there's another way you can wound people as well, which is not just by doing bad things to them that shouldn't have happened, but by not giving them the needs, not giving them what they need. So children can be wounded by being hurt in the ways that I talked about, but they can also be wounded if their essential needs for human development are not met. a lot of families where there's no overt trauma as such children are still wounded because they're not seen for who they are not accepted for who they are not valued for who they are 
when there's pressures on, on them to be different other than the way they are, that can also wound children. Now, what are the impacts of that? If they understand about the human, here's the thing. You can take an acorn, and you can say that it's the nature of the acorn to become a mighty oak tree, which it is. But is that going to happen automatically? If I put that acorn on my desk, will it ever become an oak tree? Never. Because for healthy development of that acorn, certain conditions need to be met. The same thing is true for human development. So for the brain to develop properly, you need the right environment. Now the human brain develops, I'm quoting a scientific article from Harvard now, the human develop, brain develops from conception into adulthood. So brain development begins in the womb, continues into adulthood, and it needs the right conditions. Just like the oak tree needs the right conditions for it to reach its stature. The essential condition for healthy brain development is a non-stressed environment beginning in the womb. So you can stress pregnant animals in the laboratory or pregnant women in real life and their offspring will be more likely to be addicted later on in life because that stress interferes with healthy brain development. I'm talking about still in the womb and then throughout childhood. So the what people don't appreciate that this is just modern brain science is that the circuits in the brain, including the circuits that get involved in addiction, which I can talk about, I won't name them now, but the circuits that are involved in addiction, for them to develop properly, they need an attuned, non-stressed relationship with emotionally present, non-depressed present their parents. So when this trauma happens and the parents are not able to provide those conditions, those brains don't develop the way they should. In fact, they develop in ways that predispose them to addiction. I'll give you one quick example. Doug, I don't know your personal say, were you ever addicted to opiates at all? That was my thing. I had a three, 400 milligram a day Oxycontin habit. That's what crushed me. Okay, great. Let's look at opiates, okay? Why does Oxycontin work in a human brain? Or why do the opiates work in a human brain in general? The opiates work in the human brain because we have receptors for them. In other words, on the surface of our brain cells, imagine my head is a brain cell. Then here's a receptor is a molecule where a messenger can fit. So if I have a receptor that looks like this, but there's a messenger chemical that looks like this, there's no fit. If the messenger chemical looks like this, now there's a fit. So we have receptors for opiate molecules on our brain cells. Why do we have receptors for opiate molecules? And opiates come from opium in Afghanistan. Why would I have a receptor for an opiate plant in Afghanistan? I don't. I have receptors for my brain's natural opiates. So we have natural opiates in our bodies. They're called endorphins. Endorphin means endogenous or internal opiate-like substance, morphine-like substance. Why do we have natural receptors for opiates? It's because we have opiate system in our bodies. We manufacture our own opiates. If we understand why you're addicted to fentanyl or to Oxycontin, an opiate, we have to understand what does the natural opiate do in the human brain? You know what they do? Three things. One is they relieve pain. We already talked about that. They relieve physical and emotional pain. That's why we have endorphins, internal opiates. That's the first thing they do, pain relief. The second thing they do is give us the experience of pleasure and reward, elation, joy. Try living life without that. And the third thing they do is the most important, they make possible a little thing called love. Love is the connection between parent and child, the attachment relationship. Without endorphins, that doesn't happen. So endorphins are the love chemical. So when people do endorphins, it's because they have too much pain. I'm sorry, not they do endorphins. When people do opiates, it's because they have too much pain in their lives. They need the soothing of the pain. They're lacking pleasure and reward and joy. And they're looking for the warmth of love. And that's why a heroin addicted patient of mine once told me, Doc, when I do heroin, it feels like a warm, soft hug. In other words, when you tell me that you're an opiate addict, you're telling me that early in your childhood, you didn't have the love you needed, you sustained too much pain, and you lacked pleasure and joy. And when you did that opiate chemical for the first time, you felt like a normal human being for the first time. That's what you just told me. That's my understanding. I agree. When I first did opiates, it felt like this big, warm hug. It felt like this massive weight come off my back that I could finally be at peace with who I was. I didn't have to worry about my parents' divorce or I didn't have to worry about being bullied in school. I didn't have to worry about all these 
traumatic experiences that I had as a teenager. And there's a lot of people that listen to my podcast that they might have kids or they're planning to have kids and they're probably listening to this and like, holy crap, is there anything I can do right now to what in my parenting style or in, in preparation for parenting to help prevent my kid from getting addicted to something or from experiencing some sort of childhood trauma that will impact them in adulthood? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So in my book on addiction, which is entitled In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, I have an appendix on the prevention of drug addiction. And the prevention of addiction is not telling kids that drugs are bad. The reason is because the kids that listen to adults are not at risk, and the kids who are at risk don't listen to adults. So the prevention has to actually be in the womb. So we got to start with pregnant women because already these circuits are being potentiated in the womb. So we have to start with pregnant women and say, what are the stresses in your life? What's your relationship like? How much support are you getting? Because you want to create a peaceful environment in the womb for that infant already. The second thing I say to parents is work on your own issues. Because any traumas that you haven't worked out in yourself, almost inevitably, you're going to pass it on to your kids, like I did. These things that I'm talking about now, I didn't know them when I was a young parent. And there were significant traumas that my wife had, that I had, that we haven't even realized yet. So that it's almost inevitable that parents who are not conscious will pass on their traumas to their kids. So work on your own issues. Really important. Number three, children have certain needs. In my new book, The Myth of Normal, I have a chapter on the irreducible needs of children. Those needs include unconditional loving acceptance, the capacity to experience all their emotions, whether they're anger or joy or pain. Those emotions need to be received. In other words, the question you have to start off with as a parent is, what are the needs that my children have for health development? Both in this book, The Myth of Normal, and in a previous parenting book I wrote called Hold On To Your Kids, you have to start off not with what do we want our kids to be or how do we want them to behave, but what are their needs for healthy development? And in this modern society, parents are really challenged to meet those needs. That makes a lot of sense. And I think, so I guess what you're saying is if a kid is screaming when it's mad or it's upset, a lot of times parents will take something away from them or put the kid in timeout. I guess what you're trying to say is that, that in itself could be something that could be detrimental to their emotional development. Absolutely, I'm saying that. Let's imagine you're an adult in a relationship. Right. And what if your partner's partner said to you, every time you feel anger, I'm going to make you go to your room and sit by yourself. How would that feel to you as an adult? Now, as a child, you're completely dependent on the parent. And in fact, you have this absolute need to belong to the parent and to be close to them, to be attached to them. When we say to a child, if you're angry, you have to separate from me, what you're saying to the child is, if you have a genuine feeling like anger, you can't have the relationship with me. I'm going to deprive you of what you need. In other words, we create a fear-based relationship with the child. No child develops properly under conditions of fear. And there's some very famous psychologists who counsel parents to separate. This whole idea of timeout is a toxic practice. If the punitive timeout, actually when a child is really upset, you know what they need? They need time in. They need to be held in. Oh, you're really angry, aren't you? Yes, I am. You must be really upset. Yeah. They need to be heard and held. Now, I'm not saying we put up with kids hitting their siblings. I'm not talking about permissive parenting. I'm talking about parenting that's attuned to the child. And so the more connection you have with the child, by the way, the more the child will want to do what you want them to do. But essentially, I'm talking about parenting where there's nothing the child can do to threaten the relationship. And every time I punish a child, a two-year-old doesn't know why. They doesn't know why they're doing what they're doing. They're just doing what they're doing. They don't know intentional. There's no intentional circuits up there yet. But when we punish them, they don't know why we're punishing them. All we know is that they're not acceptable to us. So it's when the child is most upset that they most need you. And they most need your understanding. And there's going to be some people, I think, listening to this that they're familiar with trauma in the sense of like severe things happening to them, whether it was some form of assault Maybe it was some form of violence, accident, like a death in the family at a young age, like whatever it was. 
And now they're hearing what you're talking about. And they might say, huh, like maybe I have experienced some of this, but maybe they're a bit older and it's been some time since these things happen. What are some signs or symptoms like in adulthood that maybe somebody needs to go back and look into some of their trauma and heal from it? It's very common for adults to recognize that something isn't working and therefore go back and what happened here. That was my case. I was a successful medical doctor. I had children. I was married. I was a respected member of the community, but I wasn't happy. I was depressed. And my children were actually afraid of me. And I had to ask myself, well, what's going on here? So trauma, what we have to understand here is that trauma is not what happened to you. That's not what the trauma is. So trauma wasn't that there was neglect or divorce or bullying or abuse. That's not the trauma. That's the traumatic event. The trauma is the wound that you sustained as a result. So I'll give you a very personal example. When I was a year old, my mother gave me to a total stranger in the street to save my life. This was in Budapest, Hungary, Second World War. So I didn't see my mom, excuse me, for five or six weeks. That was a traumatic event. The trauma was the wound that I came to believe that I wasn't wanted. When your mother gives you to a stranger and you don't see her for five or six weeks, what else can you conclude as a one-year-old that you're not wanted, you're not lovable? natural conclusion for the child. The wound was not that I was given to the stranger. The wound was the impact, what happened inside me, that I wasn't lovable. So 40 years later, 35 years later, I'm a parent, but I don't believe I'm lovable. So I become a workaholic doctor. So people will love me. I'm always available, day or night, beepers always on, delivering babies, going to emergency wards, looking after dying people. Because I'm still trying to prove to myself that I'm lovable, that my life is worth something. What is the impact of my children? Daddy's always busy. He's never available. Work is more important to him. The impact on my children is they get the message. They're not lovable. So at some point, you have to start asking yourself, why am I behaving the way I'm behaving? When my partner doesn't look at me the right way, why do I feel so hurt? When the work that I'm doing is not satisfying me, why am I doing work that doesn't satisfy me? When I get an illness, like sometimes disease wakes people up. If I get an autoimmune disease, which women, by the way, get in much higher numbers than men do, we can talk about why. Or when I get depression, or let's say I have an addiction, what am I trying to run away from? So usually we have to suffer a little bit, or a lot actually, before we start asking the right questions. That's, I wish we weren't like that as human beings, but you know what? I was like that. I didn't start asking the right questions until I realized I was suffering and I was creating suffering for others. Why? That's when the exploration begins.